This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 65, Lucas Call. In 2017, Lucas Call and his baby sister were removed from their biological mother's custody, in part because she had a learning disability and was unjustly deemed an unfit mother. They were placed in the care of a woman who had previously fostered upwards of 40 children. She was also a trained nurse who worked with the county government's child abuse investigation team. Sixteen months later, in August of 2018, that woman called 911, reporting two-year-old Lucas was unresponsive. After Lucas's death was deemed a homicide caused by blunt force trauma, his foster mother, Lisa Jo Vanderlinden, was charged with his murder. After accepting a plea agreement, Lisa, who claimed to accept responsibility for Lucas's death but never confessed to causing his injuries, received a sentence so shockingly inadequate that many have called for the judge's removal from his position. In this episode, I'll tell you Lucas's story, and you'll also hear my interview with Lucas's great-grandma, Peggy Thompson, who shared with me her anger over the injustice of Lucas's case, as well as some of her fondest memories of the sweet little boy. This is the infuriating story of Lucas Call. My sources for today were KSL.com, 2KUTV, Fox 13 Salt Lake City, the Salt Lake Tribune, Utah State Legislature, VineLink, the Utah Department of Corrections website, the Duchesne County Jail, BasinNow.com, KUER, Crime Online, KJZZ.com, Metro, the Daily Mail, the Uintah Basin Standard, ReformTalk.net, Facebook, Peggy Williams, and a series of articles by reporter Marcus Ortiz on abc 4s segment, The Justice Files. Before I get into Lucas's story, I'd like to thank my new patrons, Maria C. from Australia, Aaron from Coltmont, Pennsylvania, Wendy from Yukon, Oklahoma, Linda from High River, Alberta, Kayla from Loveland, Colorado, Tracy from North Olmsted, Ohio, and from Parts Unknown, thank you to Tricia C., Rebecca W., and Maria A. Thank you so much to all of my patrons, Your support brings me closer to my goal of devoting myself full-time to the podcast and the blog on a permanent basis. To become a patron, you can visit patreon.com slash stlcpod. All reward levels earn benefits, but at $10 a month or above, you'll get access to Patreon-exclusive bonus minisodes, which I plan to release one to two times a month. There's currently one available, but I'm hoping to get another one out shortly. Now, some of you may be familiar with the story of Alyssa Guernsey, which I've covered on Suffer the Little Children blog as well as the podcast. I even interviewed the controversial prosecutor in Alyssa's case for one episode. While researching today's story, I couldn't help but be reminded of Alyssa, whose killer also got off with a slap on the wrist. This case is just as maddening for many of the same reasons and then some. I definitely can't promise you're not going to get some of my snarky commentary, which tends to spew forth when I talk about cases that infuriate me like this one. Prepare to see red. Lucas Justin Call was born in California on April 7, 2016, to 22-year-old Shelby Lynn Squires Call and 43-year-old David Justin Call. The couple met in Colorado, got engaged at Disneyland in October of 2015, and married in California in March of 2016, just before their son entered the world. Lucas was a perfect, beautiful baby boy with big blue eyes and a head full of fine brown hair. He had some developmental disabilities, much like his mom. Shelby later said she was diagnosed as having a low IQ. Almost immediately after Lucas's birth, Shelby became pregnant again. The couple's second child, a little girl I'll call C.C., was born on February 20, 2017. Shelby was reportedly a doting mother, attending to her children's every need. 
Although they lived in California, at some point after Lucas was born, Shelby and David traveled to Vernal, Utah, where Shelby's mother, Christina Squires, and grandmother, Alta Early, lived. They planned to stay on a short-term basis for a temporary job and then return to California. However, in 2017, David was accused of possessing child pornography, arrested, and charged with 10 second-degree felony counts of sexual exploitation of a minor. Shelby stood by him, supporting him while he awaited trial. With David in jail, Shelby was a new mom caring for a one-year-old and a newborn all by herself. Like anyone would, she needed a little help from time to time. When little Cece got sick one day, Shelby asked her grandmother to take them to the emergency room, but her grandmother refused, telling her to ask her mother, who was at work. Within days, Utah's Division of Child and Family Services began an investigation after being contacted by someone with concerns that Shelby was unable to provide adequate care for her children due to her developmental disability. Concerns were also raised about Shelby's contact with David, who, because of the nature of his charges, was considered a danger to children. Even though David was in jail, and despite the fact that Shelby was a fiercely loving mother whose children never went without care, attention, and the necessities of life, DCFS removed Lucas and Cece from Shelby's custody in April of 2017. The children were placed in a foster home in Neola, Utah, which is north of Roosevelt and about 150 miles east of Salt Lake City. Lisa Joe and Cody Vanderlinden had several biological children, as well as multiple foster children, some of whom they had adopted. Over the course of several years, the Vanderlindens had fostered approximately 40 children. Lisa was a licensed practical nurse who provided services at the Deschain County Children's Justice Center in Roosevelt, a government facility where children are interviewed as part of child abuse investigations. Because of her position and the Vanderlindens' status as foster parents, Lisa was highly regarded in the community, not to mention well-connected. On July 27, 2017, David was convicted on his charges and sentenced to prison. Even so, Shelby did not regain custody of her children, as DCFS did not believe she was intellectually equipped to care for the babies. She was, however, allowed parenting time with Lucas and Cece, so she was at least able to see and spend time with the kids. Over time, Shelby began noticing injuries to Lucas's head and body, and it wasn't long before she suspected her son was being abused, while her infant daughter remained unmarked. Multiple times, Shelby reported her concerns to the DCFS employees involved in her parenting time visits and team meetings. She also reported them directly to the DCFS office in Vernal and eventually to the main DCFS office in Salt Lake City. The DCFS caseworker, initially assigned to oversee the called children, was also concerned about Lucas's safety and expressed her concerns to her supervisors, suggesting Lucas and Cece be removed from the Vanderlinden home, but her superiors chose not to act. Despite the concerns of the children's caseworker and biological mother, DCFS turned a blind eye to Lucas's injuries and allowed him and his baby sister to remain in the Vanderlinden home. The last time Shelby reported concerns of abuse to the Vernal DCFS office, she was told that if she continued making these allegations, she would be stripped of her visitation rights with both of her children. During what would turn out to be the last parenting time visit she had with her son, Shelby noticed that Lucas appeared to be afraid of his foster mother and wouldn't go near her. She also noticed that her son's health appeared to be deteriorating. Lucas had dark circles around his eyes, and his little face appeared gaunt and hollow. In addition, Shelby noticed that Lucas had suffered multiple injuries, including extensive bruising on his head, abdomen, and pelvis, scrapes and cuts on his head, and an arm broken in a place that wasn't common in children's accidental arm fractures, which Lisa explained occurred when Lucas tripped over a stick. If this all sounds too familiar, it's the same tune we've heard sung over and over by child abuser after child abuser. It was an accident. He's just clumsy. He's always bumping into things. Another child did it to him. The real shame is that DCFS allowed all of this to go on under their so-called watchful eye, especially in light of the tragedy that was soon to transpire. At around 8 a.m. on Sunday, August 5, 2018, Deschain County Sheriff's deputies were called to the large, rural home of Lisa and Cody Vanderlinden, located not far from the Pride of Neola Orchard. They were summoned on a report of an unresponsive child, and indeed, when they arrived, they found two-year-old Lucas Call very much dead, his little face covered with bruises. In a statement, the Sheriff's Office extended its condolences to everyone affected by the child's death. When Lucas's death was reported in the media, the sheriff's office did not provide any details about how the child may have died or the circumstances in which he was found. They merely referred to the incident as an unattended death and did not even disclose the victim's name. 
In fact, Lucas would not be publicly named for almost two years after he died. His little body was taken to the Utah State Medical Examiner's Office for an autopsy, and he was later cremated, his remains ultimately given back to his mother, Shelby. When investigators questioned the Vanderlinden family, including Lisa, Cody, and their biological and foster children, the true picture began to solidify. Lisa told detectives that during dinner on Saturday evening, Lucas exhibited behavioral problems, and she grew mad and frustrated with the toddler and removed him from the dinner table. During dinner, Lisa said, Lucas's face was unbruised, and that fact was even commented on during the meal, because Lucas was scheduled for an upcoming visit with Shelby, who Lisa knew had complained previously about bruises on her son's face. Later in the evening, Lisa told investigators, Lucas vomited several times, so she had to bathe and change him multiple times. She admitted to investigators that she had sole care of L.C. during the hours following dinner. Other family members were ruled out as suspects because they were not present in the home nor had control over L.C. during that time period. Other family members told investigators that when Lisa removed Lucas from the table, she took him into the bathroom and closed the door. From within, other children said they heard a loud bang, as well as Lucas vomiting and Lisa, who they described as ornery and mad, yelling at the little boy. When the pair emerged from the bathroom, they said Lucas wasn't acting normally and he wouldn't or couldn't walk. The next morning, he was dead. Friends and acquaintances of the family later told investigators that Lisa told friends she was concerned about Lucas's behavior. She told them Lucas was difficult and challenging, and while she wanted to keep and adopt the sister, she did not want to adopt him. In the days leading up to Lucas's death, they said, Lisa was overwhelmed and getting more and more frustrated with Lucas for numerous reasons. A search warrant was obtained by investigators who examined Lisa's phone and discovered that on the evening of August 4th, she had made searches regarding abdominal injuries and internal bleeding. As a licensed professional nurse, Lisa would have known that Lucas's constant vomiting was a sign of such injuries and that he needed immediate medical attention, but none was sought until Lucas was found dead the following morning. The medical examiner who conducted Lucas's autopsy found numerous bruises and abrasions to his scalp, head, face, arms, hands, abdomen, back, and legs, as well as significant internal injuries caused by blunt force trauma that resulted in his death. These injuries were consistent with child physical abuse. A pediatrician with expertise in child abuse cases also told investigators that Lucas died from injuries consistent with physical abuse that were caused by inflicted blunt force trauma and that Lucas's injuries were directly connected to his death. After Lucas died, all of the Vander Linden's biological, adopted, and foster children were removed from the home by the Division of Child and Family Services. Court documents later stated that when the children were removed, Lisa said she knew they were being taken because of what I did. During the investigation, detectives examined the family's DCFS file and noted that there were multiple unsupported slash unsubstantiated allegations of abuse and or neglect against Lisa Vander Linden, specifically for hitting or punching a minor child. Clearly, these multiple allegations weren't alarming enough to exclude her as a foster parent or remove her from her job working with child abuse victims. I mean, they were unsubstantiated, right? Surely that had nothing to do with Lisa's position or connections. DCFS said in a statement, The loss of any child impacts and devastates us. This is tragic for so many from the family and the community to our staff and other foster parents. Please know we investigate every allegation of abuse and neglect of a child. When there is an allegation involving a child in our care, a conflict team outside the division conducts the investigation to ensure heightened objectivity when evaluating safety and practice. We are seeking important answers through the investigation and are fully cooperating with the Attorney General, law enforcement, and the medical examiner through this case. We immediately opened our own internal investigation and have engaged a third party to review this case to learn all we can to protect children we serve. On Wednesday, November 7, 2018, 41-year-old Lisa Jo Vanderlinden was arrested by police in Deschain County and charged with aggravated murder, a first-degree felony, in the death of her two-year-old foster son, Lucas Call, whose name had not yet been publicly revealed. Lisa was booked briefly into the Deschain County Jail. According to the indictment documents, Despite her training as a foster parent and nurse, the defendant was completely indifferent to L.C.'s well-being and did not seek medical attention for the boy. If convicted, she faced life in prison without parole or an indeterminate term of 25 years to life in prison. At Lisa's preliminary hearing, her friend, Tiffany Duncan, testified that Lisa had confided in her about her concerns with Lucas's behavior. Tiffany said Lisa told her, Sometimes it was very difficult. He bruised easily and he fell a lot. 
Tiffany said that on the evening of August 4th, she received a phone call from Lisa about Lucas. She said he was sick. He was throwing up. She thought it was more than throwing up. She thought it was more like the flu. Lisa later told Tiffany she checked on Lucas at 3 a.m., determined he was fine, and went back to bed. The next morning, however, Lucas was dead. Tiffany testified that Lisa told her she didn't know Lucas was injured. She really didn't know. She said that they weren't there when the, he left her house. What was her response about the internal injuries? Her older son had jumped off the top bunk onto him on the floor. Also at the preliminary hearing, pediatrician and expert in child abuse and neglect cases, Dr. Corey Rude, testified, saying Lucas should have been hospitalized the night he was injured. The child is precipitously getting worse as the evening progresses. So what would call, cause these injuries, these tears, these ruptures? The primary cause is, is blunt force trauma. He's not acting himself. He's not as active. He then would continue to have sepsis and shock, which would lead to his death. Those immediate interventions can be life-saving. Um, unfortunately, um, without those, uh, children will precipitously um, go into shock and then, and then die. Despite Tiffany's testimony regarding Lisa's explanation of how Lucas was injured when her son jumped on him, Dr. Rude testified that Lucas's myriad injuries could not have been caused by a single incident. As I continued researching Lucas's story, the injustices just kept piling up. For example, here's another one. Shortly after Lisa's arrest, a woman named Kennedy Chivers created a GoFundMe for a little boy I'll call ZC, who was at the time four years old. In 2014, when ZC was about one, Tyler Chivers and his then-girlfriend had drug issues and received criminal charges, and as a result, their son was taken away. Tyler quickly cleaned up his act, successfully completed Uintah County Drug Court, completely turned his life around, and did everything he was asked to do so he could get his son back, but he didn't have a chance. According to Kennedy, the foster parents who had the baby were head of the foster program and the mom was director of nursing for child and family services in Utah. This was Lisa Vanderlinden, who DCFS convinced Tyler to sign over his parental rights to, saying it would be better for ZC. When the little boy was two, he was officially adopted by the Vanderlinden family. Tyler kept in contact with the Vanderlindens and had some visitation with ZC over the years. When Tyler and his new wife, Kennedy, had a daughter of their own, he even brought the baby to meet the Vanderlindens during visitation with his son. Two and a half years after her husband signed over his parental rights to Lisa and Cody, Kennedy was scrolling Facebook and happened upon an article about Lisa Vanderlinden being charged with the murder of a two-year-old in her care. Immediately, they leapt into action to regain custody of Tyler's son. Kennedy created the GoFundMe campaign to raise money to secure a lawyer who could help reinstate Tyler's parental rights. Kennedy and Tyler took every penny they had, along with the donations they received, and obtained a lawyer who wrote up a petition to file for temporary custody and to terminate Lisa and Cody's parental rights. The petition was approved, and a court hearing was scheduled in the case. Two hours prior to the hearing, the judge's clerk contacted Tyler's attorney, saying the petition was no longer approved and that he had awarded guardianship to Lisa's parents. According to Kennedy, this was done without telling anyone, basically open and shut. Their lawyer told them that he's never seen a case as twisted as this one in all his years of practicing law. Kennedy said Tyler is a hard worker. He is active in our church and the best husband and father I could ask for. I watch him daily talk about ZC, and you can see the sadness in his eyes. I watch his sorrow. I watch his anger. The justice system failed him. He did a few drugs and made some bad decisions, and we don't even get one chance to get him back. But Lisa commits a murder and sees him daily. You heard correctly. The entire time Lisa awaited trial for the murder of a two-year-old, she didn't spend any time in jail, and, adding insult to injury, she had visitation with ZC and all of her other kids. Even being charged with the beating death of a toddler in her care wasn't enough for DCFS or the courts to prevent this woman from being in contact with children. In March of 2020, 19 months after Lucas's death, prosecutors with the Utah Attorney General's office negotiated a plea deal with Lisa's defense attorney, Ed Brass, reducing her aggravated murder charge to child abuse homicide in exchange for her guilty plea. To the charge of child abuse homicide, a first-degree felony, what is your plea? Guilty. Utah law states that 
Criminal homicide constitutes child abuse homicide if, under circumstances not amounting to aggravated murder, the actor causes the death of a person under 18 years of age and the death results from child abuse. A. If the child abuse is done recklessly. B. If the child abuse is done with criminal negligence. Or C. If the child abuse is done intentionally, knowingly, recklessly, or with criminal negligence. Under subsection A, child abuse homicide would be a first-degree felony. Under B and C, it's a second-degree felony. Lisa pleaded guilty to child abuse homicide as a first-degree felony, which carried a maximum sentence of five years to life. The sentence would, of course, be at the judge's discretion. Upon entering her guilty plea, Lisa admitted she did not seek the prompt medical attention that would have saved Lucas's life, saying her inaction was reckless and resulted ultimately in his death. She admitted to searching online about abdominal injuries after believing he had one, although she didn't specify why she believed this or how she thought he had been injured. After the plea deal was reached, just like Christy Schaefer in Alyssa Guernsey's case, the supporters came out in droves. Reportedly, over 70 letters were written to the judge on Lisa's behalf, saying what a great, loving mother and person she was, as if the evidence in the case didn't directly contradict their statements, as if being a great and loving mother to all the other children she collected like designer purses in some way mitigated brutally beating to death an innocent two-year-old boy she only took in so she wouldn't lose his sister, who she wanted to adopt. Lisa's sentencing hearing took place on Wednesday, July 29, 2020. Prosecutors argued that Lisa should receive the maximum prison term, stating she refuses to accept responsibility for her actions and should not receive leniency. In a brief filed prior to the sentencing, they stated, The defendant acknowledges that she knew the child was growing increasingly ill during the evening of August 4th, but did not seek medical attention for the child. Prosecutor Craig Peterson said during the hearing, This little boy was beaten to death. She was the one who did it, and she didn't seek the medical care that should have been sought. The defense sought probation as Lisa's punishment. In a sentencing memorandum, attorney Ed Brass said there were no witnesses or evidence to support that his client violently abused Lucas. It continued, saying she was highly regarded, it is fair to say beloved, in her community, as evidenced by the many people who have taken the time to write to the court about her circumstances and what they feel would be justice in this case for her. She is low risk in every category except leisure and recreation, and that is only because she has elected to stay home rather than venture out in public after having been vilified in the media. She was and is active in her church. In four years, she fostered over 40 children in her home without incident prior to this case. Right. Never mind those previous allegations of Lisa beating her foster children. Those were unsubstantiated after all, right? Lisa spoke at the hearing, and in her not-quite-Oscar-worthy performance, she really committed to her crocodile tears, sobbing and sniveling as she pleaded for leniency from the judge. I loved him as if he was my own. He was going to be mine. I lost my son that day, too. I'm just breaking into my own recording here. As I was editing, I just realized what Lisa almost said there. She almost said, I lost my son that night, too. You know what that says to me? She knew that night that Lucas was going to die or had already died and left him there until the morning to be found. Anyway, sorry for the interruption. Back to the clip. And if I would have known that there was something more going on with his vomiting that night, I would have taken him to the doctor. I'm sorry to the biological family. I'm sorry to my family. And I'm sorry that I just didn't or couldn't do more that night. Did you catch that? Lisa Jo Vanderlinden legally took responsibility for Lucas's death while literally avoiding taking any responsibility for it. She couldn't do more? Really? She couldn't have taken him to a doctor or the emergency room as his condition worsened? Or she wouldn't? I have one word for Lisa's statement. Bullshit. I've already lost everything. And I just want this little piece to be able to go home. Oh my, it's been a little while since I had to bust this out, but do you hear it? The world's smallest violin? Lisa's husband, Cody, also spoke at the hearing, telling the judge that since Lucas and his sister came into their home in April of 2017, they had taken Lucas to the doctor numerous times. I guess he was trying to prove that since they hadn't hesitated to get Lucas medical care in the past, there was no reason Lisa wouldn't have sought medical attention that night if she thought he needed it. I mean... Then again, she'd never beaten him to the verge of death before either, but who's counting? 
Members of Lisa's family said Lucas struggled to bond with her, way to blame the victim, but the Vanderlindens were still moving forward with plans to adopt both Lucas and his sister. Remember, Lisa's friends told investigators she wanted to adopt his sister, but not Lucas. Lucas's mother, Shelby, also spoke at the hearing, saying she thought Lisa deserved to spend the rest of her life in prison. In this clip, Lucas's name is bleeped because his name was still not being publicized at the time. I miss my son very much, and I love my son very much. This is what I will miss, his birthday, holidays, and his smile. I miss him singing with me. When it came time to deliver Lisa's sentence, 8th District Judge Samuel Chiara said that although the evidence he heard at the preliminary hearing was fairly damning, His hands were tied because of the little Lisa admitted to, because of the perplexing plea deal, and because the allegations against her were never proven in court. The judge said this was the most difficult case he'd ever had to decide a sentence on, which I don't doubt, and he had hoped it would go to trial to reveal the facts. We do not know the truth. I don't know the truth of this situation. Lamenting the difficulty he had in deciding an appropriate punishment, Judge Chiara sentenced Lisa to one year, not in prison, but in county jail plus 14 years of probation, and a $10,000 fine. After delivering the sentence, the judge sat silently for a few moments, looking down, before adding, I hope that justice has been served. It's the best I can do as a human being in this case. With all the video conferencing and virtual meetings going on these days, we all want to look our best. If you're like me, you're probably confused by all the different methods of teeth whitening on the market. Now that I'm partnering with Smile Brilliant, I've learned a few things that you might find helpful about home teeth whitening methods. For example, LED lights are a novelty item. Whitening strips neglect the gum lines, crevices, and molars. Charcoal is abrasive and wears down your enamel. And whitening toothpaste only works on surface stains. So if none of these miracle products really works, what does? The number one product recommended by dentists is the custom-fitted tray, which usually costs an arm and a leg because they require a dentist to make them by hand using a model of your teeth. With Smile Brilliant's Lab Direct process, you can get custom-fitted teeth whitening trays at a fraction of the price without a single visit to the dentist. Using an exact model of your teeth, Smile Brilliant's lab technicians will handcraft your trays to give you the best possible whitening results. All you have to do is visit smilebrilliant.com, and when you order their system, make sure you use the coupon code CHILDREN at checkout for 30% off. When you receive the package from Smile Brilliant, it's really simple. You just make your dental impressions at home and return them using the prepaid envelope they provide you. In a matter of one week, Smile Brilliant will have your trays back in the mail. Now, Smile Brilliant has something brand new to check out. On their website, you can also pick up a Carry Pro Ultrasonic Electric Toothbrush. This toothbrush is powerful, with 40,000 vibrations per minute, five brush modes, and one full battery charge lasts 30 days. Check out the deluxe, individual, and couples packages for the Carry Pro Electric Toothbrush. Using my coupon code, CHILDREN, means you're supporting me while saving a huge amount of money. So check out SmileBrilliant.com today. After the sentencing, Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes issued a statement saying, A young child is the most vulnerable victim imaginable. The court's decision is beyond disappointing. It's a travesty and undermines the confidence of the public in our justice system's ability to protect kids from abuse and homicide. As prosecutors, we achieved in the plea deal just what we would have at trial, a first-degree felony, minus the cost of trial, and without having to traumatize other children as witnesses. The plea deal in no way limited the court's power to sentence in a way that would serve justice. The court absolutely could have sentenced Ms. Vanderlinden to serve five years to life, consistent with what we sought and what the pre-sentencing report recommended. Probation for a first-degree felony is almost unheard of. We are at a loss as to why the court ruled the way it did. We understand that it's in the sole discretion of the court to decide the sentence. While we respect the legal process, we don't have to agree with the outcome. Lisa's defense attorney, Ed Brass, said the sentence reflected the behavior Lisa admitted to, failing to render aid to Lucas, but not intentional abuse. He said she suspected Lucas was ill and made a brief but fatal error in judgment by putting him back to bed instead of seeking medical attention. Regarding the statement from the attorney general, Brass said, What's missing from their statement is how she lived the rest of her life, referring to the fact that she had fostered 40 children, raised six, and trained new foster parents for the state. 
Brass said Reyes was not present at the sentencing hearing and was not familiar with the materials the judge relied on in reaching his decision, adding, This is a statement from a politician in an election year, a politician who had literally nothing to do with the prosecution of this case. For what it's worth, Sean Reyes won the election last November, maintaining his position of attorney general, to which he was appointed in 2013. One of Lucas's cousins posted on Facebook about the sentence, saying, There was absolutely no justice served for baby Lucas today. To say I am disgusted and disappointed in the justice system and the judge who sentenced her is an understatement. If you were one of the people who wrote in to defend this woman, shame on you and please remove me as a friend. I want nothing to do with people who think that murdering babies doesn't reflect someone's character. She is no saint, so do not make her out to be one. She may not serve prison time, but I'll let everyone know who she is. Lisa Vanderlinden, you're a murderer. On July 28, 2020, the day before Lisa's sentencing, Attorney Jacqueline Carmichael, on behalf of Shelby and David Call, who was still in prison at the time, filed a lawsuit against the Division of Child and Family Services, the Department of Human Services, and Lisa and Cody Vanderlinden, requesting a jury trial and seeking unspecified damages, both economic and non-economic. The lawsuit marked the first time Lucas's name was publicized. In the suit, Shelby and David mentioned multiple child abuse allegations made against Lisa by other parents whose children she fostered. The lawsuit stated, Notwithstanding these complaints, DCFS continued to place children in the care of Mrs. Vanderlinden. The lawsuit also mentioned Shelby's last parenting time visit with Lucas when she noticed multiple injuries on her son, including major bruising, scrapes and cuts on his head, and his broken arm. She also noticed that Lucas would not go near Lisa Vanderlinden, acted afraid of her, and had an overall appearance of deteriorating health. The initial caseworker's concerns of abuse were mentioned as well, saying, Her superiors chose to do nothing. The suit continued. Shelby reported her concerns of abuse, as well as her observations of Lucas's injuries and fear of Mrs. Vanderlinden, directly to the DCFS employees involved in the visits and team meetings, to the DCFS office in Vernal, Utah, and eventually to the main DCFS office in Salt Lake City. None of her reports to the caseworkers or team meeting staff were acted upon or investigated by supervisors at the local DCFS level. On the last occasion Shelby reported her concerns to the local DCFS office in Vernal, that office threatened that if Shelby continued reporting her concerns of abuse, they would take away her visitation rights with Lucas and his sister. After Lisa's sentence, Jacqueline Carmichael told reporters that the family was devastated and deeply disappointed. State spokesperson Sarah Welliver said in a statement after the lawsuit was filed that Lucas's death was tragic. Child safety is the reason we exist, and any child death is a true heartbreak. We acknowledge the tragedy of this event and its effects on the child's family, their community, and our workers. Due to the pending litigation, as well as state law regarding client confidentiality, we unfortunately are unable to discuss any further details of this case. We trust in the legal process and will be transparent and open with the Attorney General's office throughout this litigation. Unfortunately, despite the clear-cut evidence presented, Shelby and David ultimately lost the lawsuit against all three defendants, even Lisa Jo Vanderlinden, who, remember, pleaded guilty to the child abuse homicide of two-year-old Lucas. She couldn't even be found guilty in a civil proceeding? Shelby spoke with ABC4 senior crime reporter Marcus Ortiz, who asked how she reacted when she heard the sentence. I was angry and furious. She has murdered my son, and murderers deserve um, go to prison. When asked about reporting her concerns to DCFS, Shelby said, No one believed me. They said I was a paranoid mom. Shelby talked about Lucas during the interview. He was very sweet. He was a very good boy. Um, he was really perfect in every single way. It feels like when he died, a part of me died. Shelby blamed herself for what happened. I didn't feel like I had justice. I felt like I failed my son not getting justice. When Marcus asked her why her kids were removed from her custody, Shelby told him, I have a learning disability. I have a low IQ. They didn't think you were a fit mother then? No. How does that make you feel? That made me feel awful. Shelby's step-grandmother, Peggy Thompson, told Marcus that because Lisa was a nurse, she should have known Lucas needed help, so she believed Lisa's sentence should have been stiffer. She knew, she knew my grandson was in trouble. She chose not to get him help. So for them to say that this was not premeditated, to me, is a lie. 
Peggy's daughter, Angel, was in the process of trying to adopt Lucas's baby sister, C.C., when she received a phone call on Christmas Eve telling her that the little girl had just been adopted to someone outside the family. Shelby hasn't seen her daughter since, and in fact, she's not allowed to see her, not even as much as a photo. At least one Change.org petition, although I actually came across two or three of them, was created demanding Lisa's sentence be reconsidered and Judge Samuel Chiara be removed from the bench. David Call was apparently paroled on November 10, 2020, and reportedly lives in Colorado, where he doesn't appear to be registered on the state sex offender registry, although he is registered in Utah with an address in Salt Lake City. As for Lisa Jo Vanderlinden, Utah Department of Corrections offender number 247640, who began her one-year jail sentence on July 31, 2020, she was released from the Duchesne County Jail after just nine months. That's right, she's currently walking free, now serving her 14 years of probation. Lucas was two years old when he was brutally beaten and left alone all night as he bled to death internally, and the woman who sort of took responsibility, but honestly not really, is free to do as she pleases. She's drawing breath every day, watching the sun rise and set, celebrating holidays with her family, maybe even her children. Meanwhile, heartbroken mother Shelby Call, now 27 years old, has reportedly been forbidden to have any more children by DCFS and is not allowed to have contact with her daughter. Shelby carries her son's ashes everywhere she goes in a little wooden box with his picture on the side. Sometimes she even pushes the box around in a stroller. It's all she has left. I had the honor of speaking with Shelby's grandmother, Peggy Thompson, over the weekend. I'd like to share our conversation. Shelby and David met in Colorado. Yes, they met and everything progressed quite quickly. And Shelby became pregnant with Lucas and they decided to get married. And they married in California. Shortly after Lucas was born, they came. Sorry. They came to see me and uh, my two kids. And uh, (laughs) I fell in love with that little boy. At first sight. I mean, he had my heart just boom. (laughs) It's hard because I didn't get to spend a whole lot of time with him. Like I said, they just came for a visit. And then uh, David decided that they were going to go to Utah. And Shelby and Angel, who's my oldest daughter, and I and my youngest tried to tell David, do not go to Utah. Don't go to Utah. You'll regret it. You will regret it because of the way a certain person is there. If it's not their way, then how can I put this? Let me back up a little bit. When Shelby was younger, she was told that she had to become Mormon. She wasn't given a choice. She was told that she was going to become Mormon and that's it. Well, when she got older, she decided she didn't want to be Mormon. And there's a certain person that if you don't do what this person says, then you live to regret it. And she flat out told this person that her children were not going to be baptized in any sort of way or brought into the Mormon church, period. And that person decided that they were going to do everything that they could to make their lives miserable. And that's exactly what they did. And that's what this all boils down to is Shelby said no. There were never any complaints to DCFS or anywhere else about Shelby, though, until until uh, they went back to Vernal. How did you think Shelby was doing as a mom when you, you got to see her you know, in action with Lucas when he was little? Actually, I thought she was doing phenomenal. Um, She fed the baby on time. She made sure that she checked the milk, you know, to make sure the milk wasn't too warm or too cold. In Washington, we have mosquitoes really bad at some times. And at that time, they had an alert saying that the Nile virus, you know, was definitely a thing. So David decided that he wanted to go outside and he was going to take the baby out with nothing on because it was it was warm. And I told him what they had said about the Nile virus. And he said, oh, the baby will be fine. And Shelby, I was so proud of her because she literally kicked up a fuss. And she said, no, the baby needs to be covered. Even if it's with a blanket, the baby needs to be covered. Lucas needs to be covered. And so finally, David was like, okay, fine. I'll put a blanket. We'll put a blanket on him. If the baby cried, she didn't necessarily pick him up every time. Because she had read that you're not supposed to do that because then they'll cry until you pick them up. 
but if it was like a hungry cry or if he sounded like he was not necessary, not hurt, but very distraught, she would immediately pick him up. When we went to the beach, she made sure that he was not out of the car because it was really super windy. And since great grandma couldn't go out into the sand because I have a wheelchair and all that fun stuff. And so he, he got to stay in the car with great grandma. Everything that I saw with Shelby and that baby was just, I was just like, she is going to be such a good mom. She is going to be such a good mom. She put both of her children first. And that's what pisses me off so bad. All she had was the best intentions for those babies. It seems like she was pretty well blindsided by David's arrest and that didn't uh, that Yeah, didn't help. no, that didn't help at all. Um, that's a whole other story. She had both the babies with her and everything. And then the next thing she knows, here comes CPS just out of the blue saying that they had gotten a call, basically that she was a bad mom and that she couldn't take care of her children and she couldn't do this and she couldn't do that. And we know who turned her in. I mean, it's the person that I was talking about earlier, but I was livid. I was absolutely livid when I found out. See, I did not even find out that my great grandchildren were in trouble until after Lucas died because Shelby didn't want me to worry. And she told me, she said, I didn't want you to worry and I didn't want you to be mad at me. And I said, honey, why would I be mad at you? You didn't do anything wrong. Well, she says, I feel like I have failed my children. Oh, and I said, honey, you didn't do anything. You did not do anything wrong. You tried to do the best for your kids. And CPS are the ones to blame. And you know who is the is the one to blame. She seems like she has just the biggest heart. She does. And like I said, if somebody would have just helped her, I mean, I don't know anybody who is new at being a parent because Lucas was only a year old. I don't know anybody else who would have a year old child and then have a newborn on top of it. And the husband's out of the picture. I don't know anybody who would not need help. That's a lot for anyone to handle. And for them to call her a unfit, uncapable mother, because she does have some learning disabilities. She was very capable. And that was the and, reasoning they gave. Yep. Yep. That was the reasoning they gave that. Well, that was one of the reasons. The other reason was they said that she refused to uh, not have anything to do with David. And I can understand if she was like going to see David, but he would call her on the phone to find out how the kids were doing, which to me, that's his prerogative because he is those kids dad. Even after she lost her children, she was still followed. One day she was out and she had a baby doll in a carriage and it was, uh, it was wrapped in a blanket because that's, that's how she was coping. She was trying to cope with Lucas's death. She was trying to cope with the fact that she would never see her daughter again. And that's how she was doing it. And somebody from CPS started yelling at her saying, why do you have a child? Why do you have a child? Ran up, jerked the blanket off. I guess from what Shelby said, they looked totally shocked when they saw that it was a doll. She's suffered more than almost anyone besides Lucas himself. And it, it seems like she's been treated completely unfairly throughout the whole thing. She really has. As soon as my oldest and I found out about what happened to Lucas, we immediately called CPS to try and work out custody for my great granddaughter mm -hmm. to bring her here. And my daughter was thwarted at every single turn. My daughter had almost all the papers filled out. And next thing we know, there's a message on Facebook from the people that did adopt my great granddaughter saying, oh, look what we got for Christmas. And she was adopted out on Christmas Eve. She totally got adopted out from under her. But we were not notified that she was being adopted out. We weren't told anything. We were completely kept in the dark. Where Lucas is concerned, I will not ever forget that Sunday when I was told by my granddaughter that Lucas was gone. She called me and she said, Grandma, are you sitting down? And I said, no. She says, Grandma, you need to sit down. So I sat down and she told me that Lucas was gone. And 
I dropped the phone. I, I don't even really remember much about that day. We found out later from the uh, ME that not only did he bleed to death by himself internally, but he had broken bones. His legs were broke. Ooh. His arm was broke. He had bleeding on his brain. He had bruises on his brain. He had bruises all over his body. The coroner said that little boy was literally beat to death. And that's one thing and, that Lisa never addressed or even tried to explain other than yeah. saying that her oh, son jumped on him. Oh, I know. All she kept him. saying is, oh, I love that little boy so much. I was going to adopt him and blah, 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 <laughs> blah. And I just like you lion witch. She had told many people that the only reason she even had Lucas is because of his sister. She wanted his sister. And the only way she could keep his sister is to take Lucas. But she didn't want him because he was too much trouble. One of the other things the Emmy said is that his liver was cut in half. And in order to do something like that, I mean, severe impact. Right. That's more of a, an injury you'd see in a car accident or a fall from a height. Right. All of these people that put my great grandchildren in with the Vanderlindens worked with the Vanderlindens. She had to have worked so, closely with yeah. them. That's another situation where the connections make all of the difference. Right. And you want to know something that really makes me angry? My daughter and my youngest daughter and I are not allowed to have any kind of contact at all with my great granddaughter. We can't mm -hmm. see pictures. We can't talk to her. We can't nothing. It's like we do not even exist. We can't even see pictures of her. I don't even know if my great granddaughter's safe. Just because CPS says, oh, yeah, we put her in a good home. You know, you said you had my great grandchildren in a good home before. And guess what? I've had nothing but nightmares. And so has Shelby since this whole thing began. And Shelby, bless her heart, she doesn't sleep. At the time, she was not eating. Uh, the doctor was talking about putting her in the hospital because she refused to eat. She cried all the time. She still cries all the time. She carries Lucas's ashes with her wherever she goes. It doesn't matter if she just leaves the home, leaves her house for a little bit. She carries them with her. I'm beyond angry. I cry almost constantly. Every time I think about Lucas, my heart breaks. Why her family did not stick up for her, I will never understand. Why they did not stick up for those children, I will never understand. We were told that she would get five years at the least. Which... And for her to get one year, not in prison, but in jail, where she was moddy coddled and everything else, because she did not have to go to the Draper prison. She didn't have to do any of that stuff. She was just in jail and protected. And I'm sitting there thinking she can see her family anytime she wants. She's going to be able to hug her family anytime she wants, including her tell children. them that she loves them. And my great grandson is sitting in a little pine box, his ashes. I can't hug him. I can't tell him that I love him. His mother can't hug him. Well, she tells him that she loves him every day, I'm but she sure. can't hear it back. She it's can't hear, mommy, I love you. My heart's just broken for all of you. It, it, it is one of the most unfair sentences that I've ever heard. And, and the fact that she's out already before years up, she spent nine months in there. I don't understand that. What'd she do? Get off of good behavior? It must How have been. How can you call it good behavior when she murdered a child? For her to act the way she did when she talked to the judge, was slapping Lucas's mother, was slapping me, was slapping Angel, was slapping our whole family in the face. Yeah, I couldn't help but notice how disingenuous it was. Yeah. You could tell she was acting. I wanted to reach through the screen and just strangle her with my own <laughs> bare hands. Understandable. And say, why don't you tell the truth? Why don't you tell the truth? You didn't love that little boy. You wanted that little boy gone. How are other people being with Shelby? Have people been hard on her? Very. Her whole know. family, uh, I hate to say it, but practically her whole family, because of her learning disabilities, treated her less than her yeah. whole life. And the reason I can say that is because I actually saw it. I saw it and I heard it. She was called stupid. They would tell her basically, oh, go away. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, they just belittled her left and right. It was wrong. You don't treat family like that. You don't treat somebody that you're supposed to love like that.
And she doesn't sound like she had a bad bone in her body. It sounds like she's just been sweet her entire life and she deserved yeah, better. She deserved a lot better. And so did those kids. Yeah, they sure did. I've got pictures of both of them hanging on my walls. They're old pictures, but I've got them. And uh, I cherish those pictures because that's all I got. That and, well, I don't have any memories. Well, I take that back. I do have memories where my great granddaughter is concerned because before my rights were taken away and before my daughter's rights were taken away, we were able to Skype with her. Oh, good. And she was just the sweetest little thing. She call, She even was trying to call me grandma. Oh. <laughs> it was so funny. She told my daughter what her favorite color was at that time, and it was yellow. CPS, they always say, we're doing what's best for the child. And I'm like, <laughs> no, you're not. You're doing what's best for you. Right. Or for right. that parent. You're not, you're not thinking of the child at all. I want Lisa Vanderlinden to be reminded over and over and over and over and over again that she's a murderer, that she mm -hmm. murdered an innocent baby. I don't want her to forget it. I don't want her to be able to forget. Every time she turns around, I want her to be reminded of Lucas's face. She's out and she's free, but I don't want her mind to be free. I don't want her heart to be free. I don't want her to forget ever what she did. She basically got away with murder with a slap on the wrist. In my opinion, CPS should be overhauled completely because mm -hmm. you're going to have more deaths. You're going to have more families destroyed because of people who don't give a damn. They say, oh, we work for the children. We do it for the children. BS. They because my great grandson it. is in a box with his little face plastered on the front of it, his name, his birth date, and his death date. So they can tell me all they want that they look out for the children. And I will call them bald faced liars every single time. I can only imagine the frustration you have to feel all of the time. And, and poor Shelby, you know, carrying this box around the only connection to her baby. It's yep. heartbreaking. Like I said, it goes everywhere with her. When she went into the hospital to have her hip fixed, she called me and she says, Grandma, look who's here. She says, yeah, I got a visitor. And she turned her phone and she says, he's right here by my bed. I lost it because it was Lucas. And I carry his little face around my neck. Well, at least he's close to your heart. You know, that's yep. that means a lot. Yep, he is. He's right on my heart. And it just, every time I think of not just Lucas, but every single child that has been put into a foster home and abused in some way, whether they were killed, you know, it doesn't matter. Abuse, is, like I said, abuse is abuse. It just, it breaks my heart. And some serious Things need to be changed with all CPSs. That's for sure. From what I understand, her dad is also a piece of work. My my granddaughter called me crying oh, after no. Lisa's sentencing. And I said, honey, what's wrong? And she says, Lisa didn't get anything, Grandma. I said, what do you mean she didn't get anything? And she told me and I said, yeah, you're right. She didn't get anything. And she says, you know what makes it even worse? I said, what, honey? And she says, her dad had the nerve to walk up to me and say, you tried to destroy my daughter. But <sighs> guess what? You didn't. No thought whatsoever for the mother who lost her son. Nope. All he cared about was digging a knife into her heart. None of us have gotten any justice. And like I said, my granddaughter, all she can say is, I failed Lucas. I failed Lucas, Grandma. I failed Lucas. I said, honey, you didn't fail him. You fought for him. Yeah, she sure did. She told them everything she could and all they could think to do was threaten her that she was yep. going to lose visitation with her kids just for being concerned about their safety. And it's ridiculous. Yep. I don't know if my granddaughter's ever going to get past this. I'm. How do you get past your child being murdered and your other child being taken for basically for no reason? I don't know how you get past that. My heart just goes out to her. I, I hope she can find some kind of healing. You know, it's it's got to be very difficult because the justice is never going to be what it needs to be. But I do hope she can come to some kind of terms with it and, and have a, a happy and healthy life. I hope so. I just, I don't know how, how it's going to end up with Shelby. I, I worry about her. That's why I tell her to call me and check in so I know that she's still 
okay, you know, that she's still here. Well, I keep her in my prayers and uh, ask God to, to keep her safe. And the same with my great granddaughter. I, I ask God, please just keep her safe. Let her be in a good family. And hopefully someday, let me be able to actually see her. I try not to think about the what ifs. Yeah, getting stuck in that spot is not healthy for anybody. I'm tired of being angry. I'm tired of being, and this has helped. It really has. This has helped with the anger, believe it or not. Um, oh, good. Just talking and being able to talk about the whole mess. It's been good. It's been good. Oh, I'm so Sad, glad. Sad, but good. There's got to be a lot of mixed emotions. I, I'm glad you do have the memories that you have and, and the pictures that you've got. I know you're going to hold those close to your heart, literally and yeah. figuratively. We're not going to let Lucas be forgotten. That's for sure. Yes, please don't let him be forgotten. I just don't want people to forget. And it feels like almost like people are. The children shouldn't be forgotten. They had lives, you know, and they were cut so short. They just, they don't deserve to be forgotten. Exactly. One of the memories, one of the happy memories, well, actually, I have two happy memories where Lucas is concerned. The one at the beach and we, he's sitting on my lap or my knees and I've got him kind of propped up. And he was probably about seven months old at this time, I think, is when I first saw him, six or seven months. He was so tiny. I, it's hard for me to remember. I just remember him being so small and, and cute and smell good and all that fun stuff. <laughs> right. But uh, I was kind of rocking him with my knees. And then for no reason, I just start, kind of started tickling his belly. And he gave off the biggest belly laugh. Oh. I've never heard a child have a belly laugh before. And I was just like, oh, that's so cute. And what, what I did not realize is my youngest was in the car with, and she had captured the whole moment. She captured the tickling, the laughter, everything. And so I've actually got that. And then the other really happy memory I have of him is uh, I was I was Skyping Shelby one time and I can't remember what we were talking about, but all of a sudden I see this little face come around and he smiles. And I said, peekaboo. And he kind of put his head back and he goes, peekaboo. Oh. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, that's so cute. And oh. so we played peekaboo on Skype. <laughs> those are my happy memories. Those, those are what I try to focus on. I want to remember him with that belly laugh. And I want to remember him playing peekaboo. I don't want to remember the bad stuff. Um, Just keep our family in your prayers and keep Shelby in your prayers, please, because I worry about that kid. Yeah, she's been through a lot. I think once this episode comes out, there's going to be a lot of people keeping all of you in their prayers. We would be very thankful for that. I wish I had more to tell you about Lucas. He was taken from his family at such a young age, they hardly had time to get to know him, and most of their photos are from his first year. I'll share all of the photos I found of Lucas, as well as some provided by Peggy, in the Facebook album for this episode. This story has made my heart very, very heavy. Like I told Peggy, it was one injustice after another without end. I can only hope the family, and especially Shelby, can find some kind of peace and healing and comfort in their memories of Lucas and his baby sister, since they didn't get much time with either of them. As difficult as it was, and as sad as it's left me, I'm honored to be able to tell Lucas' story here. He was a sweet, special little boy who was very much loved by his biological family, and he absolutely deserves to be remembered. There may not be justice in this case, but at least we can give Lucas and his family the gift of keeping his memory alive. Rest in peace, Lucas. You deserved so much more. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another case. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod 
and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dream Note Music, and all music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to SufferTheLittleChildrenPod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.